Gentlemen, it's that time of the year again where we gather around the campfire and talk about the random murders of a fictional kid's game. I'd hope it would be fictional. I'd already have the National Guard at Springtrap's location ready to launch the missile. So with how long and complex the original lore recap was, how bad will it be now that there's three more games? The expectations have already been set. I'm waiting for the entire fourth season of Doctor Who to be introduced here. I recommend you don't ask the handful of questions you always do, Don. Otherwise, we might legitimately be here for hours on end. Mainly because while some of this is fact, a lot of this was pieced together and some decent parts of it could be wrong. Speaking of, did you bring the MatPat AI again? Funny story, I put my laptop down on the countertop while I was taking a call. And when I came back to it five minutes later, it was gone. I'm convinced it grew legs and walked away. On its way to assassinate the real Matt Pat. Those theories aren't big enough for the both of them. Let's start from the beginning. During the late 1930s depression, the state of Utah held a little attraction called Fred Bear's Singing Show. Wait, we're starting off in Utah? And the Great Depression? I didn't know we were walking with Little Orphan Annie. I thought we were starting in 1983. How did we get sucked into the 30s? Now, the show had a bear that did really neat circus acts and even sang. Then there was this little kid that fell in love with the show, and his name was William, William Afton. So this is where the skeletal scumbag gets introduced. Didn't know he was literally aged like moldy cheese. Seems kind of obvious now when you look at him. William dreamed about recreating that childhood musical bear. So when he grew up, he opened a restaurant called Fred Bear's Family Diner, a magical place for kids and grown-ups alike, where fantasy and fun come to life. I'm not one to crush dreams, but that's certainly an interesting choice of visions. I'm sorry, but where is this from? How are we even supposed to figure this out? There was no indication of this anywhere. There was, but it was in tidbits, small little details that you had to piece together for a bigger picture. I forgot the franchise loves to be a giant jigsaw puzzle. The first characters to be introduced at the diner were Fred Bear, a golden bear with a purple top hat and bow tie, and Bonnie the Yellow Rabbit. The characters were just suits at the time worn by people to entertain, but as a result of that, there was soon to be a problem. I think the problem now is that he started a business off of one circus show. This man watched one documentary of Jack the Ripper and was like, hand me the pen. A rival restaurant, Chica's Party World, opened with real animatronic animals. There was Chica the Chicken, a pig, a frog, and Ned Bear, a cheap knockoff of Fred Bear. The creator was Henry Emily, a robotic engineer who made these characters. So this is how Henry came into the picture. What did he see to get inspired, a roadkill? Soon, Fred Bear's family diner would be put out of business and would have to merge with Chica's party world. After merging, William Afton and Henry Emily formed a partnership and with both their expertise, they would design springlock suits, animatronic suits that could be worn as costumes. In 1983, a new location opened, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, with a new cast of characters. This guy is a full-blooded embarrassment. How do you even get shamed out of your own dream? Business is an art, and he was clearly playing with finger paint. Joe, hurry up before Donald makes more analogies. There was Freddy Fazbear, Bonnie the Bunny, Chica the Chicken, and Foxy the Pirate Fox. This merger resulted in business booming. William, at this point, had a wife, three kids, and a successful entrepreneurship. But this is where the story gets grim. Road did seem too smooth. William was too busy with work and his youngest son, Evan, had to be babysat. So he installed cameras, had a golden plush bear with a way to communicate with Evan, and had his oldest child, Michael, watch over him. This is referencing the story around FNAF 4, right? Wait, you're telling me that William was the voice of the Golden Freddy the whole time? What? Wait, I didn't even listen to that. Is that who that was? Again, most of this is based on some theory, so there's nothing too concrete about some of this. However, it is heavily implied. I'm so sick of rambunctious activities going on around here. Michael wasn't too fond of Evan, and he tormented him with pranks almost every day. Evan had become terrified of the animatronics, yet one fateful day would change everything. Why didn't William stop Michael from bullying? What kind of father is he? He took advice from some of his friends, Ted Bundy and H.H. H. Holmes. During Evan's birthday party in 1983, Michael and his friends decided to prank Evan by putting him right up to Fred Bear's face. This negligence would result in the jaw of Fred Bear biting down on Evan's head. Evan's body went limp. Michael didn't know what to make of it. 
Michael's got a smoother brain than the Appalachians. And that's coming from Donald, of all people. Rushed to the hospital, Evan had little to no chance of recovering. Now, interestingly enough, his father said to him, you're broken, I will put you back together. Evan likely heard this as a golden plushie talking to him. You could have avoided this if you didn't give him an entire Build-A-Bear for a friend. Again, some certainly interesting life choices here. Then, as you heard at the end of the fourth game, Evan then passed away. After this tragedy, kids now had to wear special wristbands to prevent them from getting too close to the animatronics. Also, a new security puppet was made to protect kids from getting hurt. So you're telling me that because his son died, it was his bright idea to get them closer to an animatronic? Is that what the marionette was stationed to be? A robotic security guard? Essentially. Think of it like a bouncer, but for kids. No wonder it tried killing us. William resorted to drinking and grew incredibly restless over his son's untimely death. Consequently, he planned to take his anger out on Henry. After all, he did steal all his ideas. You'll never see more hatred than from a failed businessman. He can't run a business, and his subpar skills, his lacking skills, made him jealous. You'd think he'd take inspiration from Henry instead of growing bitter and jealous. His son did die, to be fair. To his own creation! Drunk and angry, William drove to the restaurant to take his anger out on Henry, but instead found Henry's daughter, Charlie, locked outside in the rain. Can't pick on someone your own size, so he takes down a toddler. What a joke. William took this chance and killed Charlie in the alleyway to get back at Henry. In that moment, he began his life as a killer. In the aftermath following, Fred Bear's family diner closed its doors for good as Henry was devastated. Now you'd think they would be done entirely, especially with the toll that was taken onto both William and Henry. Unfortunately, William has the tolerance of the Berlin Wall. The investigation into Charlie's death came up empty-handed. For unknown reasons, William's wife left him around this time. This resulted in him going crazy, and he constructed an underground workshop to experiment with robotics. I think he was already crazy to begin with. Yeah, but there, there's a fine line of being crazy enough to kill someone and uh, being crazy enough to build an underground uh, well, bunker. Call it Kanye crazy. Well, I guess. Not only that, but he did hallucinogenic gas experiments on his own son, Michael, making him see nightmares every night for what he did to Evan. Wait, what? He tortured his own son? And that's still not the worst thing he did? We knew this guy was walking feces, but I didn't know he ran, too. He is the main antagonist, after all. So wait, if Michael was the one having nightmares every night, does that mean FNF 4 was based on Michael's perspective? Yes, that's correct. This is, again, following the events of the fourth game. William was definitely the kid that reminded the teacher that the class had homework. The spring lock animatronics got retired, never to be used again. At least that's what the plan was. Retired publicly or privately? Because if it's just William running the show now, I don't think they were ever retired. In the face of the public. But William was still plotting in the background. Again, correct. Now set the scene to June 26th, 1985. William lured five children to the back of Freddie Fazbear's Pizza wearing the golden bonnie suit. There he killed them and discarded the remnants in a place where no one would check, the animatronics themselves. Sickening. The first one was a girl named Susie. William lured her into the back room by saying her dog had died. He stuffed her body in the Chica animatronic, Henry's own creation. The other kids' names were Gabriel, who was stuffed into Freddie, Jeremy, who was stuffed into Bonnie, Fritz, who was stuffed into Foxy, and Cassidy, who was stuffed into Golden Freddy. Hate him all you want. That's a pretty crafty way to discard a body. Seems like it would be the opposite. The smell of rotting flesh would seep into the fabric of the suits. Again, it amazes me that they weren't found there in the first place. I have to agree with Barack. Any competent investigation would have had him behind bars. Fortunately for William, he lived with Springfield police. Classic crooked cops. Guess what party the mayor is? Newspapers reported this situation as the missing children's incident. William was charged but never convicted because they had no evidence against him. The bodies were never found. Henry knew in some way it might be Afton. So he removed William from the company and closed Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. And that should have been the book closed? Case dismissed? The end? That's what we thought anyways. So two years go by and it's 1987. Henry opens a new location with new toy animatronics that have built-in security systems connected to a criminal database. The old animatronics were placed in a back room, left to wither away. This is where FNAF 2 happens, right? Yes. 
I assume the dead giveaway is the criminal database and the withered animatronics. That in 1987, when someone got mauled by a chain chomp. William saw that the new Freddy's had opened, so he went to cause problems at the new location. He went and put on the golden Bonnie suit. We don't know exactly what happened that day, but we do know it would be one of the reasons for the new location closing. What do you mean we don't know what happened? Didn't he slaughter five more houndlings? Houndlings? Why the word houndlings? Because they're not living to be houndooms. Again, it's implied, but never directly stated. Some people credit the toy animatronics roaming around as the, the criminal database trying to search for William instead of haunted robots. Either or don't follow Darwinism. It all came to a halt when a night guard by the name of Jeremy Fitzgerald got his forehead bitten off. Freddy Fazbear's new pizzeria, only weeks after being opened, closes its doors again. Now, William noticed that while he was at the premises of Freddy's, the old animatronics were acting strange. They would roam the halls at night on their own, almost as if they were possessed. I mean, he did take his Jason Voorhees cosplay a bit too seriously. So Jeremy Fitzgerald comes in and is the one that gets his head bitten off, but I think I remember something being mentioned about a guy named Fritz. Is that right? We already went over Fritz last time. He was brought in shortly after, but fired for animatronic tampering. I'm mainly highlighting the bigger things here because I'd rather not spend two additional hours talking about the smaller details. I think we're already two hours in. After Freddy's closed, William decided he would open his own Freddy's again, but it wouldn't be called Freddy's. He would open Circus Baby's Pizza World, a new branch with a new set of animatronics. These animatronics had special abilities. They could mimic voices and isolate specific children. Their endoskeletons were a way different than Henry's creations, with their components being more snake-like. Now, if I remember correctly, this is what we saw at the beginning of Sister Location, say, William Afton was explaining to another man about the features of his animatronics. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So we're on to the fifth game now, right? Yeah, time really flies in this universe. Either that or these people walk in a soap opera. Chuck E. Cheese must have enjoyed their front row seat to all of this. William kept his own creations, Funtime Freddy, Foxy, Bonnie, but he also introduced new animatronics. Ballora, which was a recreation of his wife that left him, and Circus Baby, which was designed after his daughter Elizabeth. I forgot this walking stereotype, procreated. How in the world did he manage that one? Stalking charisma must be maxed out. I think you're missing the main point that he made animatronic replicas of his wife and daughter. I didn't miss it, I just didn't necessarily know what to say. I think the words William Afton are enough of an afterthought in themselves. Now, Elizabeth always listened to William until the day she didn't. The day before Circus Baby's Pizza World officially opened, she disobeyed and got too close to Baby. The animatronic ripped her in half and swallowed her whole. And that's what happens when Pitbull owners say he doesn't bite. What a brutal way to go out. Seriously. No wonder I'd be angry at the person who made it. I was going to say it wasn't William's fault this time, but he made the friggin' machine. Why make something like that and say, this certainly won't have negative repercussions? William found her too late and she was gone. He canceled the opening of Baby's Pizza World, claiming it was due to a gas leak. As he stood at the stage, he noticed Baby's eyes changed from blue to green. Elizabeth's eye color also happened to be green. If I just caused my daughter to die, I would feel like this as well. The Rand emerged to throw yourself into oncoming traffic? Someone tell the traffic to watch out. William Afton is walking. So Afton knew something was up. Whether Baby was now possessed by Elizabeth or not, he made it his priority to learn more. As such, he went back to the old Freddy's and stole the withered animatronics and brought them back to his underground workshop. Went back to the old Freddy's? When did he ever steal the animatronics? I don't remember that being involved. It was during the third game when we played as the animatronics in the mini games and William Afton was still referred to as Purple Guy. Wait, during the third game? When I was asking why we were the walking freezers? I can't remember what you said about it then, but it was during the third game. William melted down the possessed animatronics into molten metal and injected it into the fun time animatronics. The fun times came to life, however. They were super aggressive. He needed to know more and went back to Freddy's to get more scraps. But the ghost fought back, led by Cassidy. Because breaking those animatronics open was the reason why they were able to be freed. Wait, I have a hankering in my noggin and it needs to be answered. 
Does it really need to be? Like 100%. Go ahead. If Cassidy is the host of Golden Freddy, what about Evan? Wasn't he the one to possess Golden Freddy? Where did Cassidy even come in? So this is where the theory of multiple possessions comes into play. It's theorized that Cassidy and Evan possessed Golden Freddy at the same time until the marionette, who's Charlie, sets him free. Of course, I'll explore this in detail later. That's got to be a compromising situation. Who controls what? I don't think it really matters when they're mush, Obama. Cassidy and everybody else forced William into a corner in the back room, and there laid the old springlock Bonnie. William put on the suit in an act of trying to gain power over the ghost, but the spring locks failed. William became trapped in the spring lock suit, where he would die. But not actually die, because we live in the same universe as the Ghostbusters. That's who we needed to call from the very beginning. Turns out when William killed Charlie, her soul went into puppet. The puppet then put the souls of the children into the animatronics. This was all of William's own making. He caused this. As a result, Charlie also confined his soul to that springlock suit to feel agony as long as the suit stood. One of the security guards reported a break-in at Freddy's, and Henry showed up and knew what happened. He had the back room of Freddy's sealed off, never to be uncovered again. William would be trapped there for good. And that's where the whole William Afton being alive sort of went to absolute horse manure. The main cast of deaths and events had already occurred. Now the second half is about uh, wrapping up loose ends, correct? Just like the sixth game foretold. Is it weird to say that I'm tuckered out right now? I feel like I just ran a 5K marathon. All while sitting, huh? All while sitting. William's son, Michael, was grown up now and hadn't heard from his father in a while. He remembered something about an underground workshop his dad kept secret. He went to his old childhood home and looked through the house and found the secret entrance behind a bookshelf. Oh yeah, I forgot Michael was here. I didn't know murder could be a spectator sport, but I guess Michael proved us wrong. So was he raised by his mother then? Either that or he was already grown enough to be an adult. Remember, around the time of 1983, he was a late teenager. I'd say anywhere from 14 to 17. You know, I can't blame him for wanting to get away from all of that. Lots of emotional baggage for any age to handle. Especially because your dad raised you through a talking Tom. It was an entire elevator in the house, which he couldn't believe was possible. This elevator led to an underground bunker filled with electronics and old animatronics. There was one animatronic trying to help him, and it was Circus Baby. But he didn't understand why she was helping him until he realized it could be his very own sister. After being shocked by all of this and the animatronics recognizing him, he promised he would help them out of his father's bunker. So wait, the events of Sister Location weren't because we were actually hired to work somewhere, right? Some people speculate that Michael was directly sent down there to retrieve Elizabeth, and this was around the time the restaurant was open. But others believe he went down there due to his own ambitions. Either way, we play as Michael in the fifth game. Yes, that is 100% certain. Now this might have you recall Ennard's existence. The thing that betrayed us at the end of Sister Location? Right. Putting it briefly, it's assumed that Ennard is a physical and a subconscious mix of multiple spirits being led by Elizabeth Afton. That's one messed up Petri dish. Now recall that these animatronics, or spirits, were sick and tired of being shocked and witnessing the terrible things they already have. This is where they collectively come together as Ennard to deceive Michael into letting them free. Does Elizabeth know that it's Michael down there? Her brother? The only reason I would say no is because she calls Michael someone new when first looking at him. But again, in MatPat's words, that's just a theory. Interesting. Indeed. Now, don't get it twisted. Michael was still alive. If you remember the mini game where he was walking down the street, his body became the host of all of the Funtime animatronics. Of course, his body could not tolerate machinery living inside him, and after a while, the animatronic collection was vomited from his body and ejected into the sewers. Is this why he turned purple as well? And there were two purple guys walking around? Essentially. Like father, like son. The inner rage he had towards his father motivated him to try to right his father's wrongs. This is where the first game comes in. 
He took night shifts at the old pizzeria, which the company had turned into a shell of its former self. His main goal was to study what his father had done and learn a lot about the history of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Interestingly enough, he never found his father. And that was due to William Afton being sealed away in the back room by Henry. Correct. This is also assuming that Michael and William had a falling out after Evan died. How could he not find him? He was literally in the building. If you remember in the third game, William Afton or Springtrap was discovered in a back room that was not available on the blueprints or seen by the cameras. Now this is where the events of the first game occur, but after seeing hallucinations about his brother and Golden Freddy, Michael decided to tamper with the animatronics. This results in him being fired by the company. Now was the franchise still owned by Henry? It's not confirmed, but I assume so because Michael used the alias as Mike Schmidt. If it wasn't run by Henry, he wouldn't need to use an alias because the company wouldn't know his involvement. Wait, so the first game, fourth game, and fifth game, we play as Michael Afton? That poor man has been through so much. Well, talk about karma. Karma was not playing around with him. So Michael is fired. The restaurant tanks due to business reasons, and everything has to shut down. This is where the story takes a big leap into the future. So before we leap 30 years into the future, Ennard is roaming around the sewers, William is stuck in the back room, and nobody has been put to rest. Correct. Now, Evan could have been put to rest before the third game, but then the mini games wouldn't have made any sense. Therefore, I think the time skip results in everyone suffering. My head hurts. So years go by, and it's now 2023. A new horror attraction opens, Fazbear Frights, a place to make money off the crimes around the Fazbear Entertainment franchise. Now, playing the role that Michael did in all those games, this obviously frustrated him to see his tragedies being profited on. Wait, 2023? You're telling me that the third game happened this year when we learned about all this? Yeah, that one was hard to keep secret, especially since this is our last video of the year. It's a good thing that this game isn't based on current events because we would have had a loose spring trap roaming around. I don't think even the National Guard could have helped. Now, as a result of this, Michael applied for the night guard position at Fazbear Frights. Nothing really happened at this location until the company eventually found an animatronic, a golden spring lock bonnie locked behind a wall at an old location. Now, did Michael realize that it was his father there the whole time? I'd have to say yes, because at the end of a sister location, you can clearly hear him talking to his father about freeing Elizabeth. That's also why Ennard attacked Michael, because they thought he was William. Now, whether that's before or after the third game is really hard to tell. If he smelled like yesterday's eggnog, I would think he was William too. What's interesting is that Michael had applied to the job for the main purpose of setting the remaining souls free. We're not sure if the mini games were the way to do so, or if it was just burning the place down. Either way, the souls end up being freed and the place gets burned to the ground with Springtrap inside. Was it due to Michael intentionally burning it down? I don't believe that's ever clarified. That being said, the phone dude mentioned that Fazbear's Fright did have faulty wiring, so I wouldn't be surprised if it was because of natural causes. I swear we've made more bridges of confusion than Pittsburgh. Now, somehow, William Afton survived. No matter what, he refuses to die. What one too many David Goggins videos will do to you now, if you remember Henry Emily, the other business owner behind all of this, was also one to witness the burning of Fazbear's Fright. As he knew the loose ends that needed to be tied up, he would open a new Fazbear Entertainment restaurant. Michael applied and got the job immediately. Now, were Henry and Michael doing it together and they knew the situation? What's weird is that Henry is aware of who Michael is, and Michael is aware of what he has to do but I don't believe that they ever directly communicated with each other. All Henry did was instruct Michael to be on the lookout for animatronics showing up in the back alleyway. Why would he open up another franchise in the first place? Has he actually not learned? The reason why Henry opened this location wasn't to continue the franchise, but rather to end it. He knew that if he opened another location, Afton would show up. Wait, what? It was to bait him, and not just only him, but the remainder of the animatronics as well. The marionette was one of them, who was Charlie. She took over Lefty. That's who Lefty was? That's also why they were on sale for so low. Interesting. Next was the animatronic amalgamation that was inside Michael, Ennard. 
Ennard had taken the form of Moulton Freddy, who was the one in control. So like 15 people inside one, got it. And finally, a scrappy version of Circus Baby, who belonged to the soul of his sister Elizabeth. Henry was able to see that after so many years, Michael finally got them all together. And that leads us to the final piece in motion, right? The 17th arson charge of the franchise. Exactly. Once Michael had gathered all the animatronics, Henry instructed Michael to seal all the doors and leave once, but Michael decided to stay. His torment for years on end had finally come to an end with one final flame. How poetic. Certainly a way to put it. Fazbear Entertainment was turned into a furnace with everyone inside. Henry, Michael, William Afton, Charlie, Elizabeth, and everyone else's souls that were stuck in Ennard. It all finally ended. Michael was finally free. All the tormented souls were put at peace and Henry could finally move on. Fazbear Entertainment burned to the ground. And that's it? Well, I would really like to say a fitting conclusion, but there are four more games after this. It just never ends, does it? Head hurt, Donald? More than hurt. I need a couple of Tylenols to even try to process this. In all seriousness, did that entire recap make sense? Or at least come close to? Now that there are names associated with everything, I would say so. It's actually a really well put together story when you think of it. Yeah, I won't deny the art. What Scott did here was great, terrific even. With so many moving parts all coming together so seamlessly, I can see why he's been very successful. I'm glad it's mainly come together. The story has certainly evolved a lot considering we started with just five kids getting stuffed in suits. Wow, I genuinely forgot that's how it started. Say, Joe, wanna hear a throwback line? What? Joe, you would like a video game about kids getting put in uncomfortable places. And we devolved back to the first game. It's Donald Trump here wanting to thank all of our members for supporting us. We can't thank you enough. If you would like to become a member and see exclusive content, click the link in the description.